If I asked you whether or not you care about our planet and the people who live on it, well, I'm sure that, of course, you would say that you do. It's easy to say that you care. But what are you willing to do to show that you care? Are you willing to change your buying habits? Are you willing to do some research and become a more mindful consumer? That's a little bit harder to do. Today, our guest is Dr. Mary Conway Datuan, and we're going to get to know her, and we'll learn more about social entrepreneurship. Welcome to Drummer Connections podcast series. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. In this series, I'm talking with members of the Crummer community and inviting them to share their accomplishments, challenges, and best career and business advice. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Consistently ranked as the number one MBA in the state of Florida, the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to prepare you to become a global, innovative, and responsible business leader. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. Today's guest is Dr. Mary Conway Datuan, Professor of International Business and Social Entrepreneurship at the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. She's the faculty director for the Global Links Initiative. She serves on the board of Rally, the social enterprise accelerator, where she contributes to the curriculum and mentors social entrepreneurs. She's also a visiting professor at Apade Business School in Mexico City. If you're a student or alumnus, you probably know her as the faculty member who accompanied you on an international business travel experience. And she also serves as the current faculty president at the Crummer School. Dr. Conway, Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, JB. It's lovely to be here. It's great to have you. And I'm going to start with the very last thing that I mentioned in your bio. You're not just the faculty president. You are, in fact, the first female faculty president in Crummer's 60-year history. So tell us what that means. Well, thanks for, for recognizing that. It is true. Um, but I want to say being the first female faculty president is not so great because it's me it's really tells you a little bit about our history at crummer and it tells you a little bit about sort of where we need to go and what's going on um the world right we're in a place of transition so right now we're, we've been through a lot of black lives matter but of course right before that was a lot of issues around um the me too movement right and so just the stories about where are women leaders today and where are they going in the future, the fact that it's taken Chroma over 60 years to have its first female faculty member, have its first female dean, have a significant representation of female in the faculty, that says both where we have come, where we have come from, and where we are, are looking to. And I hope that being the first female faculty member serves as a role model for other faculty members, as well as for students who are coming through Crummer or who might come into Crummer. Well, it says something to me about being a barrier breaker. And I'm just curious, do you think of yourself as a barrier breaker? And I mean, I have more to say about that because I think we need barrier breakers all around us all the time, but I'm just curious if you identify with that. Yes, I, I often talk about, um, if I were interviewing, I would say that I have a very eclectic background, right? If I'm just speaking to friends, I would say that I don't fit neatly into any one box. And if I say that, let me give you an example. So I graduated, my PhD is in marketing, but I'm an international business professor here. But actually, I'm also a professor of social entrepreneurship. So Within the disciplines, right, when we look at business problems, we want to think cross-disciplinary. That means we have to break down the barriers of the disciplines, and we have to break down the barriers. If we want to create positive change in our world, we have to break down the barriers between corporations, governments, nonprofits, and just look at and say, there are problems to be solved. What skills and assets do you have to help solve those problems? And then just break down the barriers that exist that are keeping us from solving those problems. But I would say that in this context, um, we're talking about fairness and representation, are we not? Mm -hmm. And so that that's my connection to breaking down barriers is we've seen a lot of it. I expect to see more of it. 
and, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to appeal to if we had younger listeners who feel like, oh, this is, you know, this is the world that we live in and it's not a big deal anymore. I think it's still a big deal. Yeah, I would say it is still a big deal. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's a big deal in business and, it, and, it, and it's a big deal moving forward. Um, and for me, the, the, what you might call the glass ceiling, right? The female barrier has been something that's been a part of me since I was a teenager, right? Um, when I interviewed for um, one of the magazines here, the Rollins Magazine, they asked me, how did I become interested in women's empowerment through entrepreneurship and education and the Global Links program? And I said, well, you know, I've been a feminist since 1970s, right? I was one of the first um, 100 subscribers to Ms. Magazine back in the day. Yeah, And um, so I guess that's part of who I am. And maybe that's a little why it's difficult for me to separate the b barriers that I'm breaking because it's just kind of um, who I am, right? And that means that I am probably more naturally testing whether we call those barriers or glass ceilings. And I think that makes me approach problems differently, whether it's looking to recruit students, looking to recruit faculty, looking to answer problems that really connect to the community in the classroom, right? Is, are those barriers? Yeah, and my interpretation would be this. If, if there are young people in business now who are thinking, you know, what's left, all the barriers have been broken, that is not true. <laughs> lots and lots of barriers left to break. And, and it will take all of us. Absolutely. I think that's a good way to, to sum it up. And I thank you for that. Um, and I think it takes us, the young people, working together with, um, I, I hate to call myself an older person, but let's call it that, right? The folks who have been around for a while, because change happens within context. And the energy that the students bring to the problems and the perspective that they bring is so beautifully augmented to someone who has the historical context and is willing to change, right? Because there are people who have historical context who aren't willing to change. So um, if we empower ourselves to change and we empower the, the young people or the incoming students to change, I don't mean just young in terms of age, I mean young of experience in business or young, yeah, exactly. um, that, that yeah, that then we can move forward. And um, but certainly if I were a person of color, right? So we've had the first female faculty member. We've never had a person of color be a, be a faculty president. Yeah, that's that's coming. I hope so. Yeah, exactly. I hope, yeah, in our lifetime. I agree. Um, I, I also want to put this into the context uh, of you teaching international marketing and social entrepreneurship. Now, to some of our listeners, that might sound polysyllabic, so I want to start by having you describe uh, what what is this, and you know how is it changing over time, such that you could explain where it was and where it's headed. Okay, so can I t tell you like how my journey and how I see those two things connected together? Of course. So, I mean. I Again, going back, I took my first overseas travel when I was 16 years old, right? And um, that was really eye-opening for me, both in terms of my limitations and my my moving forward. And so that international cross-cultural element of people, of myself, of the work that we do um, has always been attractive to me. And marketing for me is something we all do because almost some of our first memories are around consumption, right? And the things that we buy or the things that someone bought for us or the things that we ask for, for whatever our holidays are, where we're allowed to actually ask for gifts. And so I was, I think, naturally drawn to think, well, how do different people in different cultures think about the stuff that they buy, don't buy, have access to, or don't have access to? And to me, that's international marketing. Then once I understood a little bit more about business, right, through education, then I said, well, what about all of those things from the managerial perspective, right? So how does the decision to create a product or a service from the company, how is that influenced by that manager's lived experiences, that manager's culture, or that 
marketers um, experiences within their country or across their country. And as I gained more and more exposure to that, and then I started to see different economic and socioeconomic uh, conditions in countries, I started to ask why, which I do a lot. Why? Why do some people have access, others don't? Why is, is something more expensive in one country and less expensive in another country, right? And so that led me to look at inequalities, right? And I said, how can we use marketing knowledge and business knowledge to attack those inequalities? And so for me, that's what social entrepreneurship is. It's using business models, business approaches um, to create social wealth rather than only creating economic wealth. But with the recognition, right, that you have to have economic wealth to be sustainable, but without social wealth, economic wealth has no value. Is that too still too esoteric? Or do you think that <laughs> makes still, sense? I, I, I would give this interpretation and I, I would invite you to share an example. So the, the example that comes to mind for me is, and this is from when I was younger, hearing about in the news if there was a manufacturer of shoes or apparel or something like something that people wear that the people making the clothes and the shoes didn't have a living wage right like, hey, i got cheap shoes so maybe i don't care but increasingly there would be a public outcry of hey if you buy this brand you're contributing to you know uh, economic injustice and there are more and more people would say, I'm not going to buy this brand. So we've seen that over the course of my lifetime, that there's an expectation of fairness. And particularly now with younger generations, uh, millennials and, and Generation Z, really making buying decisions based on corporate social responsibility. They, they don't want to support brands that are oppressive. Right. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to connect it. And the fact that you started with shoes reminds me of a couple examples, actually. So, um, again, if you start with marketing, right, and it's a very individualized decision. So when I, as a consumer, right, I have some power that I can go to the market with. I have the dollars. And I vote with my dollars. Mm -hmm. And so first I have to understand, I have to have some information. Right, I go into and I go to the shoe store and I, I have to have information. And that's the beauty of what I would call globalization drivers, right? So all of the information we now have available through the World Wide Web and, and through blogs and actual videos that people are showing us. So we have, um, as consumers, we now have more information than we did before so we can make more informed decisions. But we also have to understand what, who is the producer? of the items that I make um, and how do I ensure, right? And so I started working a lot in fair trade. One of the things that um, is buried a little bit deeper in my resume is I, I work, uh, I volunteered and was former president of the board for 10,000 villages of Winter Park and 10,000 villages of Cincinnati. And that's all fair trade organizations. And so the jewelry I wear, the clothes that I have, Right. I want to buy something that's not only going to make me look good, but it's going to make me feel good because mm -hmm. my purchase has has um, provided a living wage is the word that I would use to right. the person in that place where it is produced. So if I may summarize it, a takeaway from what I'm hearing. Social, uh, excuse me, uh, corporate social responsibility international marketing and social entrepreneurship, which are your areas of expertise, are, are, are really boiled down to this. Do we care about our planet? And do we care about the people who live on it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think, um, yeah, ultimately we need to be conscious that our decisions influence not just ourselves, but others as well. And those others might be far away or they could in fact be very close by. And so if we think more consciously, if we slow down a little bit and think more con consciously about what we are purchasing, that ultimately um, 
we will make better businesses. And if we are managers, right, graduates of Crummer, and we're thinking this way, and we're actually bringing the mission of, of Crummer forward, we're thinking about not only the prosperity of our business, but the prosperity of our community. And that community can be local or global. Oh, exactly. So, so I would amend my summary to say, it's not just the people we know, and it's not just the planet we see. It's beyond everything that's in our local neighborhood to the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Our guest is Dr. Mary Conway Datuan, and we'll be back in a moment to learn more about her professional journey. Stay with us. This is JB Adams with an important message. If you're a member of the Crummer community, then you know what it means to get a degree from the Crummer School. You know that you make this decision so that you can take charge of your career and have more options for the rest of your life. And you also know that it's, it's really the people that you meet at Crummer who can hook you up with your next opportunity. So with this in mind, I wanna tell you about something new. It's called Rollins Connect. Rollins Connect is an exclusive online community for all Rollins alumni. It's a networking platform that lets you interact with alumni, find classmates, and register for events all in one place. It's gonna help you stay connected to over 40,000 Rollins alumni worldwide. Rollins Connect will be coming soon. We'll have more details to share about it in the coming weeks. That's Rollins Connect, your connection to the Crummer community. Welcome back to Crummer Connections. I'm JB Adams. Our guest is Dr. Mary Conway Datuan, Professor of International Business and Social Entrepreneurship at the Crummer School. Now, before the break, we were chatting about social entrepreneurship, and uh, this segment is our opportunity to learn more about Dr. Mary Conway Datuan's professional journey. So I think a lot of students make assumptions about what it takes to make a professor, and the truth is that each professor's career journey is uniquely different. Uh, tell us what's uniquely different about yours. You know, um, I think I'm all about leaving options open. And so let me explain how I, I think that way and how that influenced my education. So actually my undergraduate degree is in international studies and Spanish. And I thought I could go like into government, I could go into NGO work, I could work for the United Nations, um, I could be a diplomat for my country, or I could be a professor at a university. So I want to pursue things that are going to leave options open. And, and, and then toward my um, sort of senior year in college, I started playing with marketing. And I thought it was really interesting because it, it incorporates culture, it incorporates psychology, it, it, it's how people make decisions, right? Which I thought was really interesting. But when I went to get my master's, um, I still said, I got to leave doors open. I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up. So I went to um, University of Denver in a combined program. It's called the Master's of International Management, which takes courses from an MBA and from the Graduate School of International okay. Studies. I got my master's degree. I thought I need to get some work experience. I don't want to go straight for the PhD. I need to, you know, just go out and test things. And I was fortunate enough to have some scholarships um, early on, but I thought they'd work for a while. And so I worked for one of the big automotive industries. Right. Okay. And um, I got in there and I realized um, it wasn't going to work. And I could tell you all sorts of stories about how I knew that, but I just decided to quit. And I toured Europe for a while. And um, I came back and this was, I moved into, I moved to Boston. And at that time it was a really poor economic decision. And I moved to Boston and I would love at some time to talk about um, failures and how we overcome failures because. Oh yes. I, I'd love I, to talk about that. Yeah, because that was a big, that was a big failure. <laughs> but what happened is I found a job in Japan, didn't speak any Japanese. Uh, and that's where I really learned, um, again, what it, what it's like to be functionally illiterate. So education came again to be really important, mm -hmm. um, how to be open, how to, to, uh, give up a little bit of control and all that. So I, so I did all that in Japan and actually then moved to the Philippines. And I worked in corporate again in the Philippines. Uh, and I would say, here's again, that ethical influence. So I, I worked in the mahogany wood and door joinery. Like, not that I knew anything about that, 
but again, it's it was very taken... different from the automotive industry, I must say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yes and no. Still a very male-dominated business that is really um, industry-based, right? So it's a big factory. Oh yeah, I said I didn't want to work in a factory, and here I am working for factories. Um, and also a lot of ethical issues. And in that case, in the Philippines, because Philippine mahogany is a protected wood, right? There were major ethical issues. And I was a foreigner working there in a Filipino company, um, helping them to expand internationally. And so I got this really good experience of what is it like to sell from one country to another. Um, and again, always stories, lots of really interesting stories there. But I said, you know what? I need to go back to education. And I need to think about where I can make a contribution that has a positive outcome. Um, and so that is what led me to that connecting of marketing and the international and all of those experiences um, that, that came about. So yeah, you're right. You, you said each professor's career journey is uniquely different. Um, I think mine is really different. So that helps us understand how you became doctor Mary Conway Datuan, if you could summarize your career philosophy in a, in a single statement, I don't know, in a few short statements, what would you say your career philosophy is? What's the takeaway? So I think my career philosophy, two things I'd say about myself is I like to pivot and I like challenge and I like change. And so because I haven't put myself in one box, pivoting, challenging, changing is kind of what I'm about. And it's if you took a class from me, I would ask you to do the same thing. Challenge some viewpoint that you already have, pivot to another viewpoint, figure out why one, what we you know, what each contributes and, um, and make a contribution at the end of, at the end of it, Education is about problem solving. So figure out what problems you're good at solving and apply your education to solve those problems. We don't graduate like, oh, I have an MBA or, oh, I, I, may, I concentrated in finance. So hire me because I have a finance concentration. No, hire me because I can solve problems that involve the skill set of finances. Mm -hmm. And so companies have financial problems. They have marketing challenges. They have HR challenges, right? And the communities have those challenges. So what skills am I learning that help me to solve problems? Uh, I can reinterpret that easily. What you just said is true everywhere, all the time, universally. You function to solve someone's problem. And once you know what your skill set is so that you can solve some kind of problem, then you're marketable. Yes. And you also provided an excellent transition to our next segment, which is about the courses that you teach and what students should expect from them. So earlier, I mentioned that you teach courses in international marketing and social entrepreneurship. And there are many students and alumni listening right now who know you as the professor who took them on an international mm -hmm. travel experience to study business. Yeah. And I know that it's a little tricky right now because we have a pandemic and so some of the travel isn't happening and that, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, my condolences go out to the, some of the current students, mm -hmm. but I hope they get some kind of experience um, that is worthwhile for studying international business. What's your philosophy on teaching business and what should a student expect in your courses? So um, I, I don't know if you're gonna like this, but I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. Um, challenge me. Because that actually is also what I do in the class. Like if you ask what is Dr. Conway in the classroom, they're gonna the students are gonna say she she will challenge you, right? So, so I'm gonna challenge you, um, because you said I want to give condolences to the folks who can't travel. So I want to acknowledge as someone who's traveled to over 50 countries um, in the world and done a lot of things. It is a lifestyle. It is a beautiful thing. It opens windows and doors for you. My question and going back to that ability to change and challenge and pivot is what are those students doing now? Because no one in the world is traveling. So what technologies are opening our eyes and windows? What, um, what can we do to leverage what we have uh, at the risk of being a little PhD, what I would call it, effectuation theory, right? Take around what I have, what is working with me and make those experiences happen um, they're going to be different, mm -hmm. um, but they can still be valid, 
right? And they can still open your minds and your windows and your doors. And, and so change ultimately has to start with you. And so what are you doing to challenge and change yourself, right? And so certainly we've had to pivot. You mentioned Global Links, right? That's a program that's really based in, in relationships. Mm -hmm. And we bring folks over from in India and from Brazil, and we ourselves go to India and Brazil along several, several courses. And so we had to pivot to an online space. And how do you maintain those relationships in an online space? How do you have fun in, a, in an online space, right? And share those, um, what matters to you. So, so I know your question was about philosophy of teaching. And, and ultimately, I would say that is a challenge. But you having said that, um, because I don't think, I mean, we're, I don't think it helps to sit around and say, oh, I miss the days when I could fill in the blank, right? Um, I miss the days when I could run an eight minute mile. Well, what can I say, right? Well, I think you've just connected the, the dots for me and you just, you just demonstrated your philosophy in this way. We just got done saying that everyone needs to know how they solve a problem. And uh, you took my intentional question, which I set up intentionally. No, I didn't really, but you, <laughs> you took it in a, in a direction such that if the problem is we can't travel, but we still have the expectation of providing an educational experience, then we have to find a novel new way mm -hmm. of providing the, a similar or adjacent experience that accomplishes these objectives, but with without the travel. Right. And both of those things take resources. So what we had to do in some of our federal grants is reallocate the resources that we would have spent to travel mm -hmm. to enable, right? This is going to connect really well with what we were saying before, because we assume my Wi-Fi connection is really strong. Your Wi-Fi connection is really strong. Therefore, everyone in the world must have that access mm -hmm. to a Wi-Fi and to a computer that they can do these things on. And so what we did is took all the money that we would have used for travel and we bought everyone who's participating in the program, a kind of the, the word that they use in India is a booster mm -hmm. so that they can not use their own data, that they can be on their own network um, and, and have a strong enough signal to maintain the relationship that we're seeking to, to develop. So I think it causes us to relook at the way we are expending our resources and the way we are expending our time. And that was like literally a monetary way that we said, all right, if we wanna do it this way, then we need to reallocate uh, our resources and we need to re-educate ourselves, right? There's not a professor in the world who is not re-educating themselves about how to teach. And there's not a student in the world who's not re-educating themselves about how to learn. Uh, strong messages, uh, not only about problem solving, but also about stepping up to the challenge. Dr. Mary Conway Datuan, I wanna thank you for joining us on the Kramer Connections and sharing your story. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Davey. I've really had a good time. Thank you. Will you come back again? Oh, absolutely. You can tell I have lots of stories to tell. <laughs> we will have you back again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Now is a great time to consider enhancing your career success by pursuing an advanced degree in business. And the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to help you become a global, innovative, responsible business leader. To learn more about the programs and the application process, go to crummer.rollins.edu. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. Crummer Connections podcast series is a production of Victor Media Group, it's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, please follow us on your favorite social media platform. Today's show was created and hosted by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell, with production assistance by Kyle Sawyer and audio design by Aaron Trinka. Our gratitude goes out to Mike Brown and Loveland Finley in Alumni Relations for their gracious help and support. Until next time, Fiat Lux.